I want to introduce the audience to a small town called Abud, A-B-U-D, that is in Ramallah area. From Abud to Ramallah, there are seven settlements. My father's land, 85% of it, was confiscated. I cannot go to pick up my olive trees. The water meter that we have is not ours. You are not allowed to own a water meter. Now, thank you to the presenter. You made me upset, you made me happy, you made me confused, you made me everything. You and I agree on one thing, pessimistic. If you are pessimistic at 90%, I am 100% pessimistic. I don't think for a moment that there was ever a real intent on any Israeli government to seek anything short of taking over the entire land. Honestly, I will be very quick. Sir, only, only if the Israeli citizen would accept me as an equal human being, that they will exert pressure on the Israeli leadership to consider something. My question to you, sir, is this. Do you think I am out to lunch if I suggest that Israel eventually creating a reality on the Palestinian land, it is impossible to remove the 600 plus thousands Amir settlers? Do you think Israel is moving towards giving billions of dollars and convincing the world that Jordan is the future Palestinian state with the fact that 60% of the Jordanian population are also Palestinians. Are they going to force this on the people of the Middle East? Thank you. Good, thanks. We'll take, uh, take two or three questions at a time. So go ahead and then we'll ask Mr. Dodi. Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to come and see you. And thanks for coming. Edmonton. Uh, my question is that um, I have noticed, I mean, I'm very pleased that your uh, position with regards to BDS and all quite diverse, diverse, but also not familiar, it has changed. Because I remember last time you were here, your position was different. My question is, what made you change your mind? And thank you again. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, go ahead, sir. Hi. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I have two questions. First question would be, uh, I understand that we have a pessimistic view on, on what's happening here, um, but what changes would you have maybe anticipated if, uh, I believe that the parties designed this union, if they were, if they would have uh, won the election? Uh, and the other question is, um, you know, I guess we accept that uh, there has to be international pressure and this is the kind of, this is the approach that we have to take. Um, but through years and generations and generations of uh, indoctrination of Israeli citizens and uh, generations uh, of oppression uh, to Palestinians, is it possible, I mean, is it possible to actually employ a one-state solution? Is that actually, uh, like, in a pessimistic sense, is it, is it possible after everything that's happened to both sides? Good. Good. Let me go with that, Gideon. Yeah. By the end of the evening, we'll solve all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> about the question about Jordan as the Palestinian state, uh, for many years, many Israeli politicians and others played with this idea. Sharon, Ariel Sharon, was the thinker of this, that uh, Jordan will be the Palestinian state, Gaza will push into Egypt, and we solved everything. I think by now, I think by now, most of the Israelis and most of the Israeli politicians realize already that this is an impossible uh, dream. Uh, not to speak if it's moral or not moral to expel the Palestinians again, the second and third time. And I think that this is off the table right now. I don't think that anyone believes that you can expel two million Palestinians from the West Bank into Jordan. I don't think that anyone believes that without uh, 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 doing this, you solve, so-called, solve the problem. I think the main problem in Israel is that nobody has really a thought about where are we going to and what is the solution. But these kind of solutions, in, except of some very, very few, 
I think they understood that this will not happen. There was also others who saw that the more we'll tyrannize the Palestinians, they will just leave. We'll tyrannize them, we'll tyrannize them, finally they will leave. They didn't leave. And I think that uh, all those games, most of the Israeli politicians know that those, all those games lead to nowhere and will never happen, never happen. It, it's not expelling them, it's whatever is left of the West Bank is to be annexed by the Jordanians and there is a 1977 plan called the United Kingdom. Yeah, but the Jordanians don't want it. You know, with all the respect. No so, okay. And this will not be a solution. This will not be a solution. Jordan, I mean, you can change the regime in Jordan. And this was part of the plan to get rid of the king and to make, make it really a Palestinian state with a Palestinian majority. I don't think that those things can happen anymore. I hope they can't happen, but I really don't think they can happen. The problem is that there is no plan. Not that there is a secret plan what to do. There is no plan. Moshe Dayal once said, and I don't like to quote this man, but he once said that only donkeys don't change their minds. And at least for this he was right. I changed my mind throughout the 30, 40 last years so many times. <coughs> and the direction was always very clear to more and more radical solutions and to more and more radical thoughts. Because the more I saw and the more the situation on the ground became worse and worse, and the smaller the hope was that things will, solve, will be solved by themselves, for sure I went to more radical solutions. Five years ago, when, when I was in Edmonton last time, I would never speak about the one state. But I still support the two-state solution. But I think it's too late. We missed this train. This train left the, the station and will never come back. And therefore, I have to ask myself, what is the alternative? For me to support the BDS or to so support boycott on Israel while I am not boycotting Israel and living in Israel is not a very simple thing. Because I live in Israel. I mean, how can I call you to boycott when I don't boycott it? I boycott products of the occupied territories, but this is very artificial. Because the separation between the settlements and Israel is a very, very superficial separation or, or, or distinction. Israel is involved in the occupation project. All Israel is involved in it. And you can't separate. It's not only the settlers. It's not only the army. There's not one single economical financial company who doesn't have branches in the occupied territories. We all, all of us Israelis, are part of the settlement project. And therefore, this distinction that I make myself, that I don't buy uh, uh, wine or ginger from uh, the West Bank, from the settlements, is a nice solution, but it's not really a very, very uh, genuine one. But I live there, and I have no intention to stop living there. And still I believe that after all those years when Israel did not learn it in the good way, BDS is always better than bloodshed. And as I try to explain, without shaking the Israeli society, nothing will move. Now, the only question if BDS will be effective. Israel cannot claim that uh, boycott is not uh, a legitimate tool. Yeah, Israel is the first boycotter. What is the siege on Gaza if not a boycott? What is the boycott on Hamas if not BDS? I mean, Israel is doing it. What is the call for sanctions on Iran if not sanctions? So, no doubt about the legitimacy of it. The only question is, is it effective? Until now, it had some effects, the BDS. I think more and more Israelis are concerned. 
but it's still a long way to go because most of the Israelis don't feel it yet. I thought once that if Israelis will be prevent, prevented from the sales in Galerie Lafayette in Paris or in Macy's in New York or in Selfridges in London, this will bring an end to the occupation because they will not be, hand, be able to handle it. And I still believe that the way to make a change will be through this way. I don't know any other way. My only concern is, will they make the linkage between the pressure and the reasons, the price and the sin? Because Israelis paid already a lot for the occupation. And above all, in the Second Intifada, it was horrible and horrifying to be in Israel in those years. But nobody made the linkage between the occupation and the punishment. And anyone who dared, like myself, to make this linkage immediately was blamed as a traitor, as justifying terror. And I don't get now into the definition of terror, which is also something very flexible. I can assure you that any suicide bomber, any suicide bomber would rather sit in an Apache helicopter, push a button, and launch rockets on civil neighborhoods rather than go and explode himself in a, in a market in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem. But Israelis, most of them, didn't ask themselves why is a Palestinian young boy or girl ready to sacrifice his life to go to do this terrible criminal act of killing himself in the middle of a bus or a market or a street, killing tens of innocent civilians, why does he do it? And therefore, because nobody asked why, the Intifada failed and he didn't bring any advantages, any achievements to the Palestinians whatsoever. I hope that with BDS it will be more effective in the way that people will ask themselves, ah, we are going now to pay a price. Is it worth it? We are going to be punished. Is it worth it? There is also a possibility that they will, again, with all the protection walls that Israeli society had built throughout the world, immediately become more united, more nationalistic, will stand together again. This time will show, I'd rather see a political pressure on Israel by governments, by the way, this will be more effective, but this doesn't happen. I think that the day that an American president will really be devoted to put an end to the occupation, we don't need any BDS. Israel, within months, will have to put an end to the occupation. It's enough to tell Israel that a certain screw will not be supplied for the Israeli Air Force. And then I, will, I want to see how will Israel react, but all this is not happening. So, with all those complex attitudes, I really hope that BDS will be effective and will be a wake-up call for the Israeli society. About the Zionistic Union. I wrote an article, rather provocative as usual, <laughs> claiming that there is only one thing which is worse than if Mr. Netanyahu will be re-elected, and this is if the Zionistic Union will win the elections. I truly believe that the Zionistic Union, it's hard for me even to pronounce this <coughs> impossible, ugly name, let's call them labor as they used to be called until now. Let's remember with whom are we dealing. Labor is the founding father of the occupation. Labor is the founding father of the settlements project. Shimon Peres and Isaac Rabin and Moshe Dayan and Golda Meir and all the others. They are the founding fathers. Under Ehud Barak, they were built more settlements than under Netanyahu. The only difference is in the rhetorics. They speak about peace. They don't want to govern another people. They get Nobel Prize for peace. 
they sign Oslo without evacuating one settlement, one house in the settlement. So if you ask me what is better, it's better when we face reality. Especially when the world is starting to move. If Labour would have taken this, those elections and Mr. Helzer would have been elected, I know exactly what would have happened. He would immediately meet with Mahmoud Abbas, wonderful photo opportunity. He declared already that he needs five years for the peace negotiation. Five years. I told him five weeks is exaggerated. <laughs> but for doing five years, when all the plans are ready, it's all about good intentions. And if you don't have good intentions, five years are not enough. So the world would go to sleep again, the world would hug the Zionistic Union, the Americans would hug them, the UN, the EU, everyone. There would be again a renewal of the peace talks which lead to nowhere and never led to nowhere. Because the DNA of labor is about continuing the occupation. Don't be mistaken about it. The only difference if the Zionistic Union would have won, and I don't underestimate this, is about domestic politics. Because the level of racism, of nationalism, of anti-democratic legislations, of the right-wingers reached a very, very critical and dangerous stage. Labour would have put an end to it. From this point of view, Labour is much, much better, no doubt. But for me, the issue of the occupation is the issue which no other issue is as important as this. And when it comes to the occupation, there is no difference between Labour and Likud, and don't be mistaken about this. And about the last question, I just have to be able to read my handwriting, which is not... Ah, about the one-state solution is impossible. First of all, it's very easy to, to tell you, no, it's not possible. Look what happened in Yugoslavia. Look what happens in Lebanon. Look what happens in all the binational states. It's going just to the opposite direction. It doesn't work. It creates bloodshed, wars, tensions. Even in your country, it's not very clear for how long will it stay together. I came to the one-state solution as an alternative, as an option, after two visits in South Africa. South Africa inspired me a lot, that's the truth. And I saw all the problems in South Africa, and there are many problems in South Africa, and still South Africa today is a more just place than 20 years ago. And in South Africa, unthinkable things happened. Things that you would never believe 20 years ago that are going to happen. And I remember all those threats, what will be in South Africa, all the white people will be slaughtered. And it didn't happen. And I know, again, those of you who know South Africa, there is crime, there is corruption, there are many problems. But by the end of the day, when there are, and this is what really moved me, when I saw the white beggars in the freeways, and I saw the black bosses, and I saw more of equality. I don't want to say it's a full equality. I don't want to romanticize it too much. But South Africa is a proof that things which look right now unthinkable can become. Now, I can assure you one thing. The majority of the Palestinian people, not all of it, but the majority of the Palestinian people want to live together with the Jews, with the Israelis, in peace, in equal terms, in justice, obviously. The majority of the Israelis want to live separated. And that's the core issue right now. But I believe, with all the fears and the hatred, that we don't have any other alternative. And therefore, we have to start to talk about it and to work, work toward it. Maybe it is just a dream, but you know, at least we have a dream. Without the one-state solution, after losing hope in the two-state solution, you remain with nothing. So we have a goal, and I think we should try to go to this direction and to stop with this empty talking about the two-state solution, which today is only an excuse to gain more time. 
Because many, many people, not all of them, but many people in the West, and even in Israel it starts, know that there will be never a two-state solution. And if this is the case, we have to, to restart our thoughts. So, uh, well, I have Johnny up at the microphone. There's a, yeah, I wanted to, a few others can join him up there. So, Johnny, why don't you go ahead and uh, ask your question? Yeah, uh, maybe come a little bit closer to the microphone so people can hear. Good, great. Yes, go ahead. Thank you for your talk. Just a comment and then a question. The comment would be that the non humanity of the Arab person is uh, not an Israeli, not peculiar to the Israeli psyche. It's the unofficial position of the Canadian government and the American government and the British and the French. Just two examples of this about 20 years ago. Some, a reporter asked Madeleine Albright if, you know, a million dead Iraqi children, you know, what she had to say about the American sanctions that it caused a million dead children, and she said, we think that's an acceptable price to pay. Literally inconceivable that they could have talked about a million children, you know, or even a million dogs that way. So, you know, another example, recently a movie, American Sniper, basically somebody who's uh, pathological, who killed, sniped 108 people, and has no moral qualms whatsoever about it. It becomes a kind of hero. And they asked Clint Eastwood, the direct, the producer, if you know if there was a problem there that there didn't seem to be any moral questioning, self-questioning. And he pointed out that no, in one of the scenes, somebody asked the sniper if he had any moral qualms, and if you pay close attention, his eye twitched. You know, revealing that deep down there might be something there. He might have moral qualms about sniping so many people. So, my simple point was that the non humanity of the Arab is uh, pretty much the status quo uh, in Canada, in the US, at least in their policy, no doubt about it. And then the second thing I just wanted to suggest um, in terms of expulsion, of course, the world can't stomach that Israel just try to expel, you know, the Palestinians from the West Bank one. But what about other scenario? And I believe this has been Israel's long-term game plan for a while, which is what about under the fog of war? Because the first time they expelled the Palestinians was under the fog of war, and then the second time was under the fog of war, and we find them pushing for war with Iraq. War with Iraq was supposed to be you know, a great enterprise, it was going to be easy, and then Iran, and then Syria, Hezbollah, Hamas. So your you question? Know? Yeah, go yeah. ahead, your question. So that basically, what do you think of the proposition that Israel's waiting for a big war with America, with NATO, on Iran, on Syria, and under that fog of war, stage three of the Palestinian expulsion, which is the only solution. You want a Jewish state on a piece of land full of non-Jews. One plus one equals two. You either don't get your state or you expel the people. Very good. Let's move to the next one. Great, thanks. Good, I think you got that, right? Yeah, next question? Yeah, we'll take one more before we uh, let Mr. Levy in. So, um, there's uh, an election coming up in the United States next year. Could you please give us your assessment of um, the possible contenders and the party positions going into that election? And do you think that there is the possibility uh, that um, after this election, there may be the deliverance by America of the miracle that you speak of. And secondly, um, closer in time uh, for us in Canada here will probably be uh, an election in the fall time. Uh, I think we all here probably understand the uh, Conservative Party position towards Israel. Could you give us your assessment, please, of the uh, Liberal Party position and the NDP position? 
<coughs> Tom, again and again, I keep on telling you that our contract was that I'm coming to lecture you, not to answer such good questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's far beyond the... Uh, yeah, very good. You're a good audience. Yes. Uh, no, I don't think that classes or conflict between classes is the name of the game, even though there are also some consequences which are social consequences, but by the end of the day, it is about real estate. It's a national conflict about two peoples who share one piece of land, and this is the core of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I don't even like to write it, to call it conflict. Like never before anyone called the Algerian-French relations as the Algerian-French conflict. There was a French occupation in Algeria. Sorry? Okay. There was a French occupation in Algeria, and it had to come to its end. There was no French-Algerian conflict. And same, same here. But in any case, classes, religion, some other natural resources, they are all part of it, but they are not the core. The core is a national dispute over a piece of land. It's, it is about real estate. Yes, dehumanization is not only in Israel, dehumanization of Palestinians, Islamophobia plays to the hands of Israel in many ways. It's becoming worse and worse all over the world, also in Europe, by the way, not only in the United States and Canada. And still, there is a difference because in Israel, I think, it, get, it reaches a level and don't forget one thing, that in Israel we are dealing with a people who is not an immigrating people. It's a people who was there before Israel was established, who is, I hope, going to stay there forever, and therefore the dehumanizing the Palestinian people is, from my point of view, much worse. And besides, you know, if uh, you drive uh, 200 kilometers per hour in the freeway and a policeman stops you, it will not be very convincing for him if you tell him, listen, also the others drive like this. Many things that Israel does, there are also other, other peoples in other states who do similar things. So what? What, what does it say? I mean, does it release Israel from any responsibility? I'm not ready to accept it, but sure, the humanization is not only in Israel, absolutely. Expel, expel under the form of war. Again, there are all kinds of ideas in all kinds of minds, but it's not a plan. For sure there are some lunatics who believe that one day there will be this big war and then under the fall of this war we'll get rid of all the Palestinians. This is first of all not a plan. And I must tell you, considering the performance of the Israeli armed forces in the recent wars and years, I wouldn't be too confident about the outcome of such a war. And I think some Israelis know it, that those days of Israel, like in the Six Day War in 67, those days are over. And the performance of the Israeli army becomes from war to war, poorer and poorer. And I think some Israelis know it. So to build, to count on a war as something that will save Israel is by far this connection of reality. In any case, I don't think that there is a plan like this. Elections in the United States, this is why I'm not an expert for American politics, obviously, but really after the disappointment from President Obama, I really don't know what to say. I mean, who will be 
more devoted or more attached or more knowledgeable about the Palestinian problem than, than Obama. And if it didn't work with Obama, on the other hand, you see some changes in American society. You hear some alternative voices, more and more so, including in the Jewish establishment. You hear more and more voices that start to ask, does it serve the American interest? Does it even serve Israel to continue with this policy for so many years? There is no state in the world who gained so much foreign aid, support, encouragement, like Israel, throughout all those years. And I guess there will be a moment in which American decision makers will ask themselves, should it continue like this? Shouldn't be there are some limits? Does it serve peace in the world, justice, democracy? But to be frank, it happens very slowly. And you know, all those people who tell me that process, historical process, take long time, that the uh, change in the United States is very slow, and change in the world is very slow. What is your answer to the Palestinians who live now third generation under this occupation? How can you tell them that historical changes take decades and maybe centuries? And what will be about their own lives in, in, in between those changes? As about the election in Canada, I know even less. <laughs> and it really would be very fresh of me to come here and talk to you about the uh, I know one thing, I'm now one week here. I didn't meet one supporter of Harper. It's for you to answer. Right, that's true. I have to, I have to point out that uh, we uh, flew here to Alberta here today. And uh, Mr. Levy said to me, well, isn't Alberta, isn't that sort of the, the heartland of uh, Mr. Harper? I think we'll meet more people in Edmonton that, uh, that oppose my views here. And I said, no, I, I think the audience is somewhat pre-selected. Uh, I'm sure you guys know a lot of Harper supporters. I'm sure you do. Yes, go ahead. And others, if you'd like to yes, ask I, questions, we still have I a just, few more. I just have a, a question that's related to one of the earlier ones. And um, in January, when um, John Barrett was signing the Memorandum of Understanding with Israel that, that basically said that to select Israel out for criticism equals anti-Semitism, as well as some other things. Um, there was an American, uh, Palestinian-American scholar who was here giving, giving talks. His name is Stephen Salata, and he's the author of Israel's Dead Soul and four or five other books. Uh, but uh, he was fired in the United States uh, from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana uh, for his Twitter feed during the bombardment of Gaza. That was ostensibly it. He was, he was said that he was uncivil and therefore he couldn't possibly teach there. And uh, I'm very interested in, 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 in the other part of the story, which, which wasn't articulated by the university, but he was one of the people who was initiating uh, the, boy, the academic boycott in the United States, um, which, is, which is very controversial. Um, and I wonder if you speak about the academic Boycott. Great, thank you. And we'll take one very last question for the evening then. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Uh, I was just wondering about the uh, Israel society, I think, is you know, partly obviously religious and partly secular. I was wondering about the Jewish um, religious groups and their spirituality, because to me, this is an issue, this is really a moral issue that's not being dealt with and has been ignored. I was wondering what their, the Jewish religious groups, how they feel about this whole issue of the occupation and how they rationalize it. Great, thank you. And now our last question for the evening. Yeah, go ahead. I, I feel with you. I can see your disappointment for the fate of Israel and the Palestinians. I'm a woman, so I believe there's always a way. I feel, I think, before starting the war, important 
to stop the demonization of the Palestinian people in the East and for people to recognize that we are worth saving, they should see us as humans. Uh, I believe that boycott is the first step. And I thank you for saying this. Uh, I, I also think that you being a pessimist, you'll be able to change the world, but optimists don't. But how do you suggest that we can help, that you and conscientious, moral people like yourself, with passion for social justice, can change the image that's being painted every day about the Palestinian terrorist who is not really worth saving? And also, what's the next step? What do you suggest we can do to change this? Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. So, Gideon, uh, I'll ask Gideon to answer these questions. When he's done, give me just another 45 seconds and we'll do our drawing. So, just stick in your seats another 30 seconds when he's done. Thank you. I think I need like two hours for those four questions. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's okay with you. Well, it's only 8.06. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, in Montreal, it's, uh, it's 5.06. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I took once the Trans-Siberian uh, train in Russia, and in one of the stops, my ticket showed the uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I came at 4 o'clock to the railway station, and then I realized, not many people know it, that in Russia, all the plane tickets and the train tickets are Moscow time. <laughs> now it was four hours difference between Moscow time and the place I've seen. <laughs> you should consider it. <laughs> About the academic boycott, it's really a, a, not a simple question, because on one hand, the academia in Israel is a part and parcel of the occupation, no doubt about it. They have those, first of all, there are some universities like the University of Ariel, which are in the occupied territories. Secondly, they have all kinds of special programs for soldiers, for settlers, for secret service workers, and many, many others, pilots. So they are for sure part of the occupation, no doubt about it. On the other hand, it is, by the end of the day, the most liberal part of Israel. And therefore, to aim the boycott at the most liberal part in Israel is problematic, only because it's, in many ways, easier to aim it at them. So I don't know from which direction to take it. On the other hand, it's very effective. And, and, and the academia in Israel, in Israel is very, very aware to the, to the boycott and it's, it's a main, main issue there. So I, I, I can't give a bottom line about it because it goes to both directions. Yes, if we go for boycott, we have to go for boycott, uh, whatever it will be. But to aim it only on the academia is a little unfair and uh, uh, so I think. Within the, the academia, there are some of the most progressive voices in Israel today. Not all of them, obviously. And the academia is to be blamed for many activities which have to do directly with the occupation. Yeah, that's the question about Israel as a secular <coughs> society and about the religious and orthodox. First of all, I want to claim here that Israel is much less secular than it seems from the outside. Don't be mistaken. First of all, the raison d'etre. Why, why did the Jews come to this part of the world? It's all about religion. I mean, it has nothing to do with real politics. It has to, why did they choose this piece of land? It's based on the Bible. You can't deny that this is a religious belief. It has nothing to do with sovereignty can be a very holy place for the Jews. And still, what's the connection between holiness and sovereignty? Many Jews are going now to Uman in Ukraine. There is a very, very holy grave there. And thousands, tens of thousands of Jews are going there from Israel every year now to this grave of 
Rabbi Nachman from Uma. Anyone claims for sovereignty on this place? It's a, a holy place and people go there and come back. So the basic of Israel is religious, among other things. But also if you look at any other possible way, Israel is the most religious society in the Western world. No buses on Shabbat, on Saturday. I mean, what is it if not religious society, fundamentalistic society? El Al doesn't fly on Shabbat. You can't marry and get divorced only through a religious ceremony. What is it? Until recently, you couldn't be buried without a religious ceremony. What is it if not a religious society? There's a mezuzah almost at every door in Israel. So this pretension of being very, very secular, Yom Kippur, no caste, 70 percent of the Israelis fast in Yom Kippur, 65 percent, this is all deeply religious. And there is this problem which really we'll not get into it now. What is, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the Jewish people? which is a nationality, or are we talking about the Jewish religion? I don't want to get into this, but I just want to first of all say that Israel is much less secular than it seems from the outside. And Israel is moving toward more and more religious faces. In the last war in Gaza, rabbis were blessing the units before they entered Gaza. Rabbis were blessing soldiers. You know that every soldier in the IDF, when he gets into the IDF, he's taking to the Wailing Wall to swear. What does this have to do with secular? The last chief of staff of the army, secular chief of staff, the last day he was in office, he went with the new elected chief of staff to the Wailing Wall. A wall. This is secular behavior? For sure not. So Israel is less secular even if Israel wants and all of us want to pretend that at least part of us are very secular and very liberal. And Israel is going toward a more religious phase. And by the way, in 10 years, the majority of Israeli children in the first and second grade in schools will be either Orthodox or Palestinians, which means most of the children of Israel will be not Zionistic. Maybe this is a source of optimism. <laughs> the religious, they differ because you can't speak about the Orthodox in Israel as one entity. There are two main groups. One are, and I'm sorry because part of, the, of you, I guess, know all this, Part of, our, of them are the ultra-Orthodox, the one who wear black usually. They have very little to do with occupation, settlements. They don't serve in the army. Part of them, small part of them, claim to be anti-Zionist. There is this group, the Tuaikata, who meets with the Iranians again and again and with Arafat at the time to call to exterminate the state of Israel. But they are a very, very small group. But most of the Haredi, the black ones, are mainly concerned about their own way of living, their own manners, their own budgets. In recent years, they participate a lot in the settlement project. And the biggest settlements today belong to them. But they go there only because they get their cheap housing. And therefore, it will be very easy to evacuate them. They, it has nothing to do with ideology. They go there because today, the cheapest housing you can get, you get in the West Bank. When you steal land, land is free, obviously, you pay less for the house. The problem is with the national religious. And they are the core of the settlers' movement. And they are the strongest, not the biggest, but the strongest and most effective group in Israeli society. They are ready to sacrifice, they are ready 
to fight for a cause. They are the settlers who blackmail government after government in Israel, who take hostage Israel. But I never blame them. I blame those who are ready to, to, to play this game. And they are the core of the whole settlement project. So by the end of the day, they took Israel to this direction. But the one to be really blamed for it is the silent majority who, in its blindness and apathy, enables all this. There are very, very few Orthodox or religious Jews who stand for morality. We have this wonderful organization of Rabbis for Human Rights, a remarkable organization. But they are a very, very small minority. Unfortunately, in Israel, religion goes with nationalism. And it's very unfortunate. So that it has nothing to do with human rights. And it's very, very unfortunate. How to change the image of the Palestinians? And what should be the next step? And what should we do? You know. Every morning I ask myself, and I don't have an answer, what should I do? So who am I to tell others what to do when I hardly know what I can do or what should I do? The Palestinians are today in the worst position ever, I believe. Totally isolated, totally lonely, without anyone to support them, not in the Arab world, not in the West, not in the East. No one to finance them. It was the EU and the United States and Israel are always threatening to stop the financial support. Israel is not supporting Israel. It's supposed to transfer them their own money, which belongs to them through taxes. And Israel, as you know, doesn't do it in the recent months. And the economic situation in the West Bank and in Gaza is catastrophic and will become worse and worse. But they are isolated, they are divided like never before, which is also just a tragedy to see this division between Hamas and Fatah, which is the biggest enemy of the Palestinians right now, this division which until now nobody was able to overcome it. And they are really forgotten in the world, more and more so. The world is now much more busy with ISIS, with Syria, with Iraq, with Yemen, with the immigrants in Europe, with Islamophobia, with many, many other issues. And the Palestinian issue is not so much on the table like it used to be for many, many years. And this place against the Palestinians and it plays in favor of the continuous of the occupation. I really don't know how to change it. I wish the Palestinians could have get united. Yes, please. Can I just ask? Sure. You sure. Just place it to your, your statement there. But he's the boss. That do you refer? Okay. Just because it relates, and you were to ask like this question is just something that I just thought about uh, after I read a book by Michael Moore, who is this left wing filmmaker. He once wrote I don't know if it was a fictitious letter or a real letter to Yasser Arafat, who once described that the Palestinians as a, as a whole should almost just come to the streets and wear white as a surrendering sort of symbolism and sit and do nothing but just a, almost like a, I guess, a sit and let the world just wait for them to have to eventually focus their attention on them. Mm -hmm. And he promises to Arafat without one bullet or any violent action that you sit there, just sit there and wait it out as you've you know, gone through so much suffering so many decades that eventually cameras of the world, the eyes of the world, will turn on you. And this certainly is a stunt, of course. But it almost seems like, you know, in, when you're talking about not having hope today, that this could be the way to do it, is that to say, listen, you've got 40% or 50% unemployment. You've got nothing to do anyway. Your lives are, are really under insufferable uh, conditions. Maybe this is the way to do it. And if it takes weeks, months, years, and eventually the, the Israeli society will then start to hear a narrative that starts to play into, look at, it's not about a violent um, expression all the time, that there is this peaceful and 
So I'm just wondering, is that yeah. potentially a realistic endeavor? I, I, it, it, sounds, it sounds very romantic, but I know what will happen. This was this is exactly what I wanted to say. This is exactly what I wanted to say. Israel will not enable it to happen. And like in many villages when they try this non-violent resistance, it always ends up with violence, with shootings, with killings. And I'm not one of those who believe in this. I know that many people saw that this should be the way. Israel is not India they don't have a Gandhi, and I don't think that this will be effective because by the end of the day we see what, what happens in those villages. The whole village is going every Friday to demonstrate, and it's enough. One voice, one stone which someone throws, doesn't throw, and immediately starts the tear gas and the, and the shooting and the killing. And, and it's the end of the thing. I don't, I never believed in it because the Israeli army is by far too brutal to let this happen. Unfortunately, I mean, it sounds fantastic, but it will not work. You wanted to ask something and then we'll continue. Yes, Mr. Lim, you just said that uh, Israel was founded on religious uh, grounds, and uh, I politely want to disagree with you because uh, the Zionist founders were basically atheists. And it was a colonial European project. And after the Holocaust, the group that came later on basically found solace in religion and founded, uh, basically added Judaism to it. And we can go back to the book uh, written by survivors of the Holocaust, by like Israel Shahat, who basically wrote the Jewish fundamentalism. So uh, are you sure that it was founded on religious purposes or? After the project was created, and then we basically threw in the, uh, <coughs> the, the whole aspect of religion just to cement it, just like the way we had, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jesus being used in slavery and exterminations of natives uh, after the first uh, yeah. founding fathers. No, 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 no argument between us, not at all. I totally agree to what you said. The only thing I said was that the choice. To do it in Palestine, to do it in this piece of land, was based on either theological beliefs or on the Bible or on some kind of bonds of generations which were religious ones. All of those who established Zionism, or most of them were totally atheists and seculars, but they used this as an excuse to do it there. The excuse was religious. The choice to do it in Palestine was based on the Bible. No doubt about this. Otherwise, why there and not in Uganda? There was an idea to do it in Uganda. I don't know what would have happened if Israel would have been established in Uganda. There was an idea to do it in Argentina, in other places. The choice to go there was based on some religious elements. That's all what I said, and we have no argument whatsoever. Uh, because time was running out, I would like, like only to tell you how really moved I am time after time, evening after evening now, in those talks and meetings, by the level of knowledge, by the level of involvement. I mean, I always say if I would have had a talk in uh, Tel Aviv, I guess a phone box would be enough. <laughs> and even then, I'm not sure it would have filled up. <laughs> and it's great to come and to see this involvement. Organizations like Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East and others. And to know that even if a government shows such a, in my point of view, bizarre, <laughs> to say the least, bizarre uh, attitude toward Israel, which again, I must say, has nothing to do with friendship toward Israel, which is really, really endangering Israel, endangering the existence of Israel.
pushing Israel into more extremism and more nationalism and ignores international law and ignores human rights. Canada, that had a lot of reputation in these fields, is today really, in my view, playing. When I saw in the conference of APAC, when your foreign minister showed up there, applauding Netanyahu, you know, let's say, let's, let's just say that it was bizarre, and not, uh, not say, say no more. But then to come here and to see all of you and hear those questions and involvement and seriousness and readiness to listen. Unfortunately, I didn't have in this whole tour one hostile question, which is also something that I'm not used to. <laughs> really, maybe I, maybe it was something wrong in me, I don't know. <laughs> so in any case, I would like from the bottom of my heart to thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you.